Yeah, I mean, so if you and I do a thought experiment and we say, how good is technology going to be in 20 years from now? We both are automatically going to assume better. Yes. You know, we may disagree on when AGI will arrive, if ever. We may agree or disagree on whether nanobots will be in our bloodstream. We may agree or disagree on all sorts of things, but it's going to be an agreement or disagreement based upon how much better, not if better. Yep. Now, if if we pose the question, how are you and I going to be in 20 years? The explicit assumption is we're just going to decay, decline, and walk our way to death. All, the only question is how much can you slow it down? But there's no assumption we're getting better. It's just how fast can you stop the decay? Mm -hmm. And so the question I think that is most interesting is can we as a species put ourselves on an improvement curve like technology? Could you and I have this conversation? Like, what would the world look like if you and I said, um, we don't know how much better we're going to be in 20 years from now? And I don't know what kind of superhero I'm going to be, but I know I'm going to be better. And what if we legitimately, wholeheartedly believe that? <laughs> This is a, a stimulator for tear production. I'm just that, doing this quickly. That is interesting. What does it do? I, ha I, I got diagnosed with a dry eye in a routine exam. Uh, we were doing a bunch of biomarkers for the eyes. And the doctor looked at my eyes and he saw that I had inadequate tear production. So I, I had dry eye. And so he started me with these synthetic drops, which you do five times a day to keep the eye properly moisturized. And then we found this device, I tier 100, got an RX for it, and it stimulates the side of the nose. So it hits the nerve that triggers the natural uh, creation of drops for the eyes. So I now do it twice a day. It's, it's amazing. It keeps my eyes dry. I didn't realize that um, it was really irritating before. I just had normalized to it and I didn't realize it's happening. So this is wonderful. So now I just remembered that I need to do it. Okay, Brian, first of all, welcome. Uh, I don't think you would remember we met many years ago. I had my exit recently from my mobile payments company. You were a veteran. You were one and a half year ahead. You exited from your mobile payments company. Uh, and, and funny enough, our conversation was a weird one because I remember walking up to you and saying, Brian, what the hell is this? It feels like shit. And, and and I remember uh, you said, Kunal, this conversation we need to have a walk for. So we walked out of that meeting room and you took me on a walk. And, and it's funny, we were the only people who discussed it. Almost felt like a first session that explained to me uh, why exits cause this feeling of depression. Yes. And and you, you gave me the perfect understanding of you will see your friends behave differently. You will mm. see your relatives behave differently. You will see that you want to do something and you'll be frustrated. Uh, it's going to go through a process of a year and, and you'll have to do something about it. And, and you actually just broke it down for me. And I, I still remember it was so perfect. And I have done this for at least another 50 founders. So I'm the guy who calls people when people have an exit in two weeks. And I tell them, I know it feels like shit. So let me tell you what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody is like, oh, they are congratulating you. And, and like, they're just saying, hey, you've had a great outcome. And what you would feel like is absolutely just like shit, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember yeah. this conversation at all. I absolutely do. We were in that room. Uh, we were sitting right next to each other. You had blue pants on, I think like a gray sweater. Yeah, <laughs> I, re I remember it so clearly and we went outside. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm real. Uh, so it's wonderful to be connected again. And I'm glad that it was useful to you in some way. So I'm going to give you a quick thing what happened after that. I spent a bunch of time investing in companies uh, uh, we are all extreme people. I've ended up investing in probably 250 companies by now. Uh, I was briefly with YC, briefly with Sequoia, decided to build my own company. Uh, Cred is what I started uh, uh, a little over four and a half years ago. Uh, and the companies had a great run. Uh, uh, and and we, we our last valuation was $6 billion. I don't know what valuation means in this time, but it, that's what the outcome was. And and uh, uh, I, I, I have never felt happier uh, Investing was good, but nothing feels as good as building things. 
so that's been a little bit of my journey. You've done all sorts of things, Brian. I'm, I'm going to go quickly into the journey. Uh, you were the, the guy who bought Venmo for literally nothing, built that up, exited your company for close to $800 million uh, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. And, and you've done all sorts of crazy things. Can you just give us a little bit of a background on what the journey has been uh, uh, and, and what have you been doing after your exit? Sure. I mean, first of all, good job, you. Congratulations. Thank you. That's a big deal. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the short story on my side is uh, at the age of 21, I determined I wanted to spend my life doing something meaningful for the human race. And I had in the back of my mind this idea that imagining people in the 25th century having a conversation about the early 21st century and commenting on the things that happened in that time frame that changed the course of human history. And I wanted to do something that would be part of that conversation. And so it was really, it's been a game for my entire professional career of trying to quiet the noise and see through you know, what is trendy or popular or whatever and identifying what really matters for the future of human civil civilization. And you know, payments was something I was doing along the way. It was an objective I had to make a whole bunch of money and then try to do these endeavors. Because typically these endeavors, if you need to, sometimes you can start and bootstrap something and, and work your way into something big. Other times having your own money is really useful. And so I just basically said, I, I'm going to go down to try to make the money path and to do something useful. Yeah, so payments was a path to get there. And so ever since I've really been working on trying to do things on that time scale. Amazing. Uh, Brian, you you uh, dabbled with a few things. You, I remember you mentioning about just starting that fund, which is investing in all sorts of crazy ideas. And, and, uh, and I remember briefly, you started your journey before you got onto the real blueprint idea. You actually were playing with something to do with neuro uh, uh, and brain, mm -hmm. and, and there was something going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done three things since having sold a Braintree Venmo. First is I started a venture fund, OS fund, and I put $100 million into it. And the idea was that if there's a problem in the world that can be solved by software engineers typing away on a computer, as a species, we're doing really well at that. You know, if, if a website needs to be coded up or a software application or something of zeros and ones, millions and millions of people around the world can step up and be equal to the challenge of coding. We have this infrastructure of, of web resources and open source libraries, and it's really great. If we have a problem in the physical world, like how do you build coral reef that can adapt to new acidic environments, or how do you capture CO2 out of the air, or, or, or you know, dozens and dozens of problems, we don't have the same infrastructure where millions upon millions of people who just spin up and say, I can solve this problem in physical reality, engineering atoms and molecules and organisms. And so I wanted to invest in the companies that were building this layer of technology so that we could engineer the physical world, atoms, and all on the stack, atoms, molecules, and organisms. So some of the technology, some of the companies I invested in, for example, like uh, Ginkgo Bioworks uh, has become an emergent leader in synthetic biology. They like, you know, I, I guess an example to make this understandable is if somebody wants rose oil today, typically it's you plant the rose, uh, you plant it in the in the ground, you water it, you fertilize it, you harvest it, and you get the rose oil. Uh, Ginkgo said, why don't we just take a organism like yeast, program the yeast to uh, manufacture the rose oil. We eliminate having to plant it, water it, fertilize it, take up a, a, a land. And so basically you can use biology to manufacture the things you want. And now they've really, they're spanning everything from goods and uh, chemicals to all kinds of stuff. And so my portfolio companies were, were basically doing that at the nanotechnology scale of building atom by atom things by synthetic biology, computational therapeutics. And so it was a wonderful experience for me uh, to get deep into the trenches with scientists, entrepreneurs 
at every layer and work with them on physical world building. So it was, it was a first grade experience. And then after that, I, I started a kernel, which uh, the idea there is we can, uh, society moves forward as we can uh, predictably engineer things. So for example, when someone buys a washer and dryer, they don't think about whether it fits through their front door. They just assume it's going to fit through the front door because there's an engineering standard that people build to for door size and these things. So when we can measure something, we build standards around it. And right now we don't have standards around the brain because we can't measure it. You can get an MRI, but it's very difficult and expensive. You can use EEG, but the resolution is really bad. And there's just no way to reliably engineer the world around our brain because we don't have the measurement. And so the goal at Kernel was, could we build technology that would become mainstream available for everyone to quantify their brain? So instead of me having to express my feelings on what I think I'm doing with my brain, I can get data on a routine and easy basis about what's happening. And so you can answer questions like, I, I uh, participated as a pilot participant in a study. I took intramuscular ketamine and we were able to pose this question, what happens to someone's brain when they take ketamine? And we measured my brain for five days before, during ketamine and 30 days afterwards. And it was the first time in, in history that's been done. Wow. And it's really interesting that you know, we, we have not to date been able to, to answer what happens to someone brain, someone's brain when they take ketamine. The best we've been able to do is people offering their perspectives on like, well, I felt like I was having, you know, a psychedelic experience or I felt happier or whatever. And so being able to speak with data in a, uh, you know, a quantitative framework really helps to structure it. And so uh, we've built the tech, it works. We have uh, several studies we've published and now we're working on commercialization on depression and cognitive decline. And so if, if we can get this technology to market, it would change the world because it would be the equivalent of like our, you know, the trackers we wear in our wrists for our sleep and exercise heart rate. Uh, it would be on par with that, that we would now be able to track the most important organ of our body, our brains, which currently is like the only thing we can't measure about ourselves. And then finally, I started Blueprint, which is you know, trying to uh, work on health and wellness and aging, but really a, a larger philosophical question of how do we imagine ourselves being the next evolution of human? I love it. Um it's a complicated field. There is lots of complications of people putting all sorts of rules. Uh, uh, I remember I had tweeted something uh, way back in 2012, 2012 or 2013 that if Olympics was not about who's the best, but who created the best drug uh, for the people to compete in Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, the human evolution would be at a different place because there'll be an incentive to create, uh, and, and it's a controversial opinion. Uh, that can we do that? And and I'm curious to know how did you get personally motivated to do this? Because the biggest thing I know that you've done, you are not preaching stuff, you are demonstrating stuff with a lot of evidence. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to know how did it start and what is the evidence that you have created? And, and I'm just like, what is the connection? Like what's going on over here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so if you and I do a thought experiment, and we say, how good is technology going to be in 20 years from now? We both are automatically going to assume better. Yes. You know, we may disagree on when AGI will arrive, if ever. We may agree or disagree on whether nanobots will be in our bloodstream. We may agree or disagree on all sorts of things. But it's going to be an agreement or disagreement based upon how much better, not if better. Yep. Now, if if we pose the question, how are you and I going to be in 20 years? The explicit assumption is we're just going to decay, decline, and walk our way to death. All, the only question is how much can you slow it down? But there's no assumption we're getting better. It's just how fast can you stop the decay? Mm -hmm. And so the question I think that is most interesting is can we as a species put ourselves on an improvement curve like technology? Could you and I have this conversation? Like, what would the world look like if you and I said, um, we don't know how much better we're going to be in 20 years from now. And I don't know what kind of superhero I'm going to be, but I know I'm going to be better. And what if we legitimately, wholeheartedly believe that? And that's what I've tried to do with Blueprint is I tried to build an algorithm that attaches me 
to science and technology, to the, the rates of improvement in science and technology, where I improve the compounded rate. And in that case, I've built an algorithm that takes better care of me than I can. So in the same way, reason why I use a, a digital navigation system versus a map or a washing machine versus washing my clothes at the creek, I basically have said, this algorithm is better at taking care of me than I can myself. And it offers me the, the potential of improving at the speed of technology and science I'm in. I like take me along for this ride. And so I'm trying to suggest uh, it's time for us as a species to say, okay, long enough have we been sacrificing ourselves at the altar of technology where we work, we sleep under our desks, we stress ourselves out so we can build better technology so that can live on. Meanwhile, we accept our inevitable decay and decline. So we are martyrs for technological progress, willing to accept our demise. That deal is no longer good. We need to switch this equation so that our technology is in service of us and everything we do is for the betterment of humans. It's just been backwards thus far. I'm, I'm, I mean, I love the way you have articulated this. I'm, I'm curious though, what was that moment where you felt, aha, I am on to something big. And, and I'm curious to know if you can share some data points on your current health. I, I know you have slowed it down already and you have a lot of roadmap ahead of you. So if you can just talk about the data now and what was mm -hmm. that moment where you were like, this is the penny drop moment for me? There were two things happened. One is for years in building my startups. I mean, I was building a multiple startups. I had three little babies and uh, you know, a difficult relationship and I was leaving a uh, born into religion. So, I mean, life was really stressful. And I was also, I had chronic depression. So like, life was really hard and every day I just kind of didn't want to carry on. And so at night, you know, after the day was done, the kids were bathed. I told them their stories and put them into bed. Uh, the only way that I, only thing I could do to try to soothe my pain, excruciating pain of life was to overeat. You know, like eating food to a point of binging myself was in my effort to try to soothe my pain. And it led to me being 60 pounds heavier than I am now. And that would wreck my sleep and it would ruin my next day. It would like just have all these catastrophic consequences. And I tried to stop myself from doing that for years. And I was helpless to stop myself. So I, it was this moment where I was like, this is really weird. I know this is bad for me. I know that it ruins my conscious experience, making me miserable. I cannot stop it. I'm powerless to stop myself from self-destructive behavior. How weird is that, that I can't stop it? And so one day I was playfully uh, thinking like, what do I do? And I said, okay, evening, Brian, 7 p.m., you asshole, you show up every day and you do this and you ruin life for everyone else. Morning, Brian, work, Brian, in the mirror, Brian. Like every other version of me hates you because you make us do these terrible things at night. And it was like this abracadabra moment where I, I suddenly felt like I had power over these different versions of myself that I could just say, no, evening, Brian, when you show up and you tell me to binge and eat this and that, you're a terrible influence on me. And so it was this, this uh, reconciliation of knowing that I'm many different versions of myself, thousands of different kinds of Brian's. Uh, I'm not a single identity. And I had power in that moment. And so that was where I started playing around with that. And the second thing that happened was I'm a pilot. I was flying an airplane one day and I was using my hands to manually keep the plane steady. And then I flipped on the autopilot and the, paint, the plane just sat up straight, just perfect posture. I thought, oh my goodness, what if I could create an autopilot for myself? Like, you know, cause I was sitting there ruminating, like, ah, like I just can't get over it. Why well, I can't control myself. And so that's when I came up with the idea of blueprint and the autonomous self is, it's time that we humans build algorithms that put us on this improvement curve and correct for our own inability to engage in this self-destructive behavior. Because if you look at it, we are an incredibly self-destructive species mm -hmm. with ourselves, with each other and our planet. And it's so out of control, we just try to bury it. We've normalized self-destructive behavior so much and we protect it that if a person doesn't want to participate in it, we call them weird and we ostracize them. So like I've get, I've received a lot of that. People may think I'm really weird because I don't participate in these self-destructive harm rituals of society. I love it. Uh, 
you you put up a post about self destructive score you put up a twitter post and say that what have you done i was not very pleased at myself when i had to evaluate <laughs> from that lens. yeah it wasn't yeah. fun but i can totally relate to this uh Brian, the hardest part is this part right you you understand everything i often meet nutritionists and all the other people and i 90% of times i know better than them because i am a curious person i have like researched everything that matters and 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 but it's hard to do this like and i'm speaking mm-hmm. my own mm-hmm. personal experience it's not been something that i've managed to solve you know i lost uh, 60 pounds between uh, that conversation i had with you and then i started my startup again i've got that exactly back so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's a it's an interesting thing that so how did you manage to conquer the hardest organ the brain yeah um i love your honesty and self deprecation i mean that really is it's a liberating thing when we can be honest that we are all powerless mm-hmm. against ourselves and there's no re- there's no need to cover it up or pretend we all have the same struggle um it was i guess there were a few psychological things i did uh, one is we we live in a society uh that wants to satiate discomfort the moment it appears so if someone's even slightly bored pick up the phone and get a hit of heroin by looking at tiktok mm-hmm. or reach to the junk food to eat even when you're not hungry we have such a low tolerance for discomfort and everything around us soothes us all the time we become accustomed to just being having a binky in our mouth of all the ways we can soothe ourselves binge watching and all the above and i had to rebuild my reality to my my baseline of what is stimulation what is pleasure and i had to remap my pleasure to say i find it pleasurable to be in a state of slight discomfort and whether that be slight hunger or uh slight boredom or whatever to seek it out because in my life everything i value sits on the other side of pain there's nothing i value which has come for free i've had to work through it and push through the difficulty that includes relationship building working through hard conversations working through when i want to give up on a certain thing like we all know these things are true and then i'd say second thing is i don't give myself um freedom of action i know if i give myself choice i will mess it up every single time i just know this i cannot trust myself to make the right decision and so i've created the system to say it is much better for me to exist in a system which makes all these decisions for me than for me to have to battle and make 50 decisions a day of do i eat do i have a second helping do i have this dessert do i do this thing or that thing i will just lose that battle and so blueprint is basically to say as a species we've arrived to a point where algorithms are showing so i i hope that what i've shown is like blueprint is a, is a world first demonstration i've shown an algorithm takes better care of me than i can myself based upon science and data now we know when these things happen uh inevitabilities arise now i would argue if you say what kind of idea is blueprint is it like i'm going to uh throw uh garbage your way because i don't think this is right because i think it's dystopic because it offends my sensibilities because whatever like all your reason all your just all of your points and i'd argue when these things happen in society if you just look at the fundamental characteristics of energy efficiency of the laws of the universe this is a demonstrated inev- inevitability and it's going to sell right through the stormy seas of human opinion it doesn't matter what we think about this it doesn't matter if it offends us it doesn't matter if it hits the most sacred thing we have it's 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 not it doesn't matter um it is a more efficient way to manage our systems than we can ourselves and to me it's the most exciting thing we could ever imagine because it it says we can walk into this next phase of human evolutionary existence but we have to realize at the root of everything we care about as the hindrance is our self our helplessness to stop our own self destructive behaviors um i i want to ask you, you, you 
I, if I'm not wrong, you have slowed down your aging by close to 30% or, or nearly close to 30%. And that's like, it seems crazy. Uh, first, I'm curious, uh, uh, why do you get all this hate for that? I'm, I'm, I've not understood that part. And I don't know if you've analyzed that behavior on why are people hating because they cannot do it and you can do it. Is that is that what's making them cause that hate? And second is uh, 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 like, what do you think is the limit? Like, can you make it 50%? Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, I understand people's hate. I really do. And I love them. Uh, I don't take any of it personally. Um, Blueprint is a commentary on society where when each of us goes to work, we go by 20 fast food chains, 20 additional places that sell sugary drinks, you know, 50, 75 grams of sugar. We then have to navigate a heroin-like addiction of, of TikTok. We then have to navigate alcohol with friends, binge watching, porn, junk food. Society has taken its godlike powers and pointed them at getting us all to be addicted. And then we all look at ourselves and we're like, damn, I'm unhappy because we're surrounded by this thing. And so it's it's a commentary that we have really done a terrible job as a society setting everyone up to fail. And so when people are looking at their own selves, I understand this myself. We all feel helpless to change. It's, I mean, like to stop our self-destructive behaviors. When we have the availability of reaching for heroin everywhere we go in the form of digital media, in the form of junk food in the form of all these things, it is so easy. Society's made it so easy for us to do engage in these self-destructive behaviors. And it's so normalized that we embrace it, uh, that it becomes the norm. And so I, I really, I understand what people are saying, like the situation's bad. They feel bad. They want to change. They feel helpless to change. And so I, I really think it's, it's a good uh, point of reflection for us to say, maybe we should make some serious contemplations on how we build our society. Like maybe the way we're doing things is not ideal for each one of us and all of us. Um, the, the routine and the, the, the actual autopilot that you've created for yourself through Blueprint, is it something that people who do not have much money can do? Or is it yes. limited to people? And, and can you just talk a little bit about the, the core principles or tenets of blueprint yes and so i've i have spent millions of dollars developing this protocol i've made all of it available for free for everyone and so in the us if someone were to do the entirety of blueprint it's one thousand five hundred dollars a month which includes all your groceries but there's even lower cost versions and so even at the at the entry point stopping or minimizing self-destructive behaviors is the most powerful thing anybody can do at no cost. So that includes, for example, uh, stop eating too much, you know, <laughs> stop eating junk food, uh, stop skipping sleep, don't drink, don't smoke, like just stop doing bad stuff. That's free for everybody. And that's oftentimes much more powerful than doing positive things. Because when we do positive things, like we, we work out at the gym and then it's like dinner comes like, well, I worked out for an hour today. I can probably afford two brownies because I already burned the calories. Like we, we do the we play these games in our mind. And so just stopping self-destructive behavior. And then other simple ones like sleep, uh, sleep is my highest, my single highest priority in life. And that is exactly opposite to cultural norms where people are like, you know, it doesn't matter if you can sleep, if you only sleep three to four hours a night, you're a hero. If you work for three days straight, you're a hero. It's Our culture has been uh, communicating to people the wrong message that you're a hero if you don't sleep. It's totally contrary to scientific evidence. Uh, so I prioritize sleep as my number one thing in my life because the difference between hope and despair is a good night's sleep. When <laughs> I have a great night's sleep, the next day, I feel like anything is amazing. When I have a bad night's sleep, everything feels frustrating and not possible. So I know my own state as a human being uh, dram is dramatically affected by my sleep. And so a bunch of these basic things everybody can do at no cost because Blueprint at the basics, all I'm saying is get good sleep, eat good food, don't eat too much food, don't eat junk food and don't do uh, self-destructive behaviors. Like, like 
remove the $2 million number, remove the eccentric things I do. We all know these basics are true. We've been taught them our whole lives. We just don't do them. So it's absolutely accessible by everybody. Uh, it's quite interesting. I, I should tell you what happened when I saw your post of this perfect scores for days and weeks on your sleep. And I've been wearing the Aura ring for a while and I've like barely crossed 80 uh, consistently. And I was like, I, I mean, classic competitive self. I'm like, I'm sure I should be able to do that. So I figured out a way to get that. And I got a week continuously of 85 plus. I think it was probably the most sharpest week I had mm. at work because I was like absolutely sharp at everything that I was doing, was yeah. not getting tired, was not getting tired middle of the day. And and it's it's sort of addictive because it just makes you better almost instantly. So I it, love that. And good job. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious. Uh, uh, how How do you manage to get this perfect scores? What's going on? So when you make it a priority, I've built my life around sleep. I love it. And so, for example, like I eat all my food from 6 a.m. to roughly noon every day. So I eat in a six-hour window. I fast for 18 hours because I found after running hundreds of experiments, my resting heart rate right before bed is the best predictor of my sleep quality. So when my heart rate's around 45 or so, I'm going to have a great night's sleep. And then when seven, I go to bed at 8.30, when seven, you know, 7.30 rolls around, my family, we stop everything we're doing. We get together and we hang out for an hour. We wind down. So we stretch, we talk, we maybe watch something, but it's wind down time. We, we, we forget the day's events and we just have fun with each other. And that helps me when, I, when my head hits the pillow, I'm not ruminating on the 50 problems I have. Because the problem is if I go to bed if I worked right up to my bedtime, I will ruminate all night long, tossing and turning over the same problem. And when I have that hour to wind down and just relax, I go to bed peaceful. And then I have other things like I black out my bedroom. So uh, there's no light that comes in. I, I have the luxury of sleeping independently. So I don't have to coordinate with a partner coming to bed at a different time, getting up at night, waking me up. And so I just do all these things. I've built up this, uh, this protocol that... Uh, it just delivers reliably high quality sleep every single night. I don't have this thing of like, what's going to happen when I go to bed. And so I guess I say sleep is a lighthouse. It, it cannot be negotiated with. It's not going to move. So the storm can, the seas can crash up against it, but it's never going to move. Not for work, not for social events, not for anything. It just stays the same every day. And that's really been liberating because if you, again, if you leave yourself, if you leave yourself room for choice, are you going to eat dessert or not? Are you going to negotiate sleep or not? You will lose every single time. So I just have had to figure out, I need to remove choice from my life because if I don't, I will make the wrong decision every time. Amazing. Uh, you, you've had a period where you had an unhealthy life and uh, now you're living a very different kind of life. What is the difference in everything that you do? Like talk about how's work, How's everything else that you do? Like, can you just give us a yeah. sense? Of, and, and and it's not that you're really biologically young, you're, you're aging, but a lot of things yes. change. Can you just talk about what are the differences? Yeah. I mean, to your point, when you were making the comment that you had achieved, you know, above 85% for a week and your perceived sense of clarity of mind, I mm -hmm. would echo that. And I would just say, I, I've been pretty public over the past 10 years or so, writing my thoughts in blog posts and whatnot. And I would just say, if you, ob I could offer up and say, I feel great, but it like, doesn't matter. I don't care. <laughs> if you just objectively look at the quality of my ideas over this 10 year period, I think that I would say they objectively are higher quality intellectual output. I think there's been a clarity of thought that I've been able to achieve having this lifestyle than the, the numbness of what societal standards produce today, where you're perpetually tired, you're always groggy, you feel terrible because you've eaten the wrong foods and too much food and whatever the case. I've never had a cleaner conscious experience in my entire life. And in my estimation, it's why, for example, in this moment, to me, it feels like this idea that like, so the obviousness of like, hey, 
we are an extremely self-destructive species, starting with myself. That's crazy. What are we doing? And even though it's right in front of our face, I couldn't see it before. But I guess now that I'm in this space, these things become much, it becomes much more possible to see them. And like what, if you really try to punch through and say, what does the 25th century people say about the early 21st century? Trying to tackle that thought process is so much um, easier when you're in a good, healthy state. And so really to me, it's been the clarity of thought and the quality of what my brain can produce. And, you know, like maybe the root of our problems of why we fight each other so much and why there's so much violence and why you know, like we're just at each other's throats. Maybe it's because we all feel so awful about life. You know, maybe it's because of our sleep and our foods and our addiction to patterns. So uh, to me, this is at the root. This is why I think blueprint is like a, it's a revolution and an evolution of, of the future of being human. Like uh, it just, you can't get, um, we need to, I mean, this is a different conversation, but this is like, I was basically trying to solve the goal alignment problem. We talk about AI progressing and we say, oh, we need to align ourselves with AI. Like, what does that even mean? Humans have billions of different goals. Even within us, we all have hundreds or even thousands of different goals. And so the goal alignment problem is not to say, I mean, what people, when people say goal alignment, it's like, what they're saying is they want everyone else to align their goals to theirs, <laughs> right? It's like, it's not like what's in everyone's best interest. And so I was trying to solve the goal and problem within me, within Brian, to say, how could I have my 70 plus organs goal aligned with each other? And how can I as an individual be goal aligned? Because before I was a, you know, a balkanized war zone. Uh, while you've been on this journey, what are some of the super interesting things that happened to your body or in your behaviors? Like, can you just talk about any anecdotes that happened and also shocked you for all the shocking things that you do? It shocked shocked you. Yeah, I mean, there was this one time at Braintree where a customer called in wanting to do business with my company, and for some reason, I was really irritable. And so we had a conversation. Then he called back a few minutes later. My coworker answered, and um, and she said, "Okay, oh, yeah, he called because he said the person he spoke to before was an asshole. He wanted to speak to someone else." And I was like, "Oh." Like, what am I doing? Like, I'm the CEO of this company. Customers are calling to do business with me and I'm being a jerk. Like, what's wrong with the situation? And I think that's really, you know, when, when you're not feeling well, like when I was chronically depressed, not sleeping every night, overweight, all the bad stuff in life, addicted to everything, I just was irritable and I couldn't see things clearly. Everything felt foggy. It all felt gray. It all felt numb. And now I'd say my disposition is calm and peaceful and steady I don't really get offended. I don't have fights. I don't like, it's just, everything's okay. And I've never had a more peaceful existence. I just don't ride these huge waves of, um, I did before. It's just, it's an entirely different way to be conscious. Uh, we're going through a very interesting time where a generation pretty much is born into addictive content. Yeah. Short videos, uh, TikToks of the world. Uh, and, and and it's going to do some impact to the brain. What do you think is really happening to our brain? And, and, uh, and, and, and therefore we are super easy to offend. I can, I can feel that we are kind of, and, and somehow I have a feeling that a lot of us, at least and I've seen the younger lot feels they are all celebrities somehow because they, they tend to have mm. some followers and they watch some stuff and they are uh, easy to trigger. What's your read on this situation? This is uh, probably the most controversial idea that I've expressed. Mm -hmm. um, in order for me to address the challenges I had in being human, I needed to put aside the thing that I thought was my most valuable tool, my mind. You know, we are accustomed to uh, thinking. When I have a problem to deal with, I use my mind to solve that problem. And so in the case of Blueprint, I said, my mind is my problem. And if I don't, I need to kill you know, my nemesis before my nemesis kills me. And so I flipped it and I said, okay, instead of using my mind of going to the grocery store and looking at the things and picking 
through the clever marketing, packaging, and colors, and branding, and looking at menus of the restaurant and perusing my pantry, I'm going to empower my organs to have authority in deciding how I live my life. And so I measured every organ in my body, enable them to speak with data, like, hey, liver, how are you doing? What do you need to thrive? And hey, heart, hey, lungs. And they all spoke with data. We matched that data with scientific evidence. And then we created a clinical grade protocol. And I said, I'm going to opt in. I will do exactly what the algorithm says and never deviate. That's my only responsibility is follow the algorithm. And that has created the best wellness of my conscious existence, like by far removing our minds. And I would postulate as a species, if we want to thrive as a species, we may need to set aside our minds. Our minds, which we think are our saviors of all problems, may be our nemesis. And it's such a radical flip uh, to put on its head. It's almost like, you know, is the earth the center of the universe? No, it's not. You have to reorient your reality to like remap your, the universe. Uh, is there quantum-like uncertainty? You know, is there Heisenberg-like uncertainty with particles? Yes. Uh, is is uh, space and time relative? Yes. Like these really big ideas, they exist and we have to reorient our reality around it. And I would postulate if we are going to be able to make a sustainable planet, maintain a sustainable planet Earth, not destroy ourselves in violence uh, and actually create a future with AI that is positive. I think the one thing we need to consider is putting aside our minds as the architects of this whole thing. And so just like my body is its own architect now and its own uh, authority and not my mind, I think uh, in this contemplation of digital media and algorithms and what our mind wants, maybe it doesn't matter what our mind wants. Maybe uh, we should just set that aside and, and consider a different way uh, to get at authority on how to exist. Huh. That's an interesting idea. It seems like a core solution to a lot of the problems that we talked about earlier. Uh, let's just talk about uh, where the future is headed in terms of the uh, the stuff that is coming up in health, wellness, uh, devices, tools, measurements, drugs, supplements, uh, uh, all sorts of drinks, uh, drugs. Are, like you, you notice that a lot of people talk about the Vigovi thing when Elon Musk was kind of talking about that. And, and I'm sure there is more stuff coming on the way. What is, what is, what is going to be future looking like? Where, where do you, because you are obviously at the forefront on the edge of these things. What do you see? The there's a lot of big stuff coming. Uh, it's not certain when the big stuff's going to arrive, but it's definitely coming. And so I'd say that if somebody lives in the 20th century, it would have been reasonable for that person to say, you know what, I'm going to live hard in life and do, I'm going to participate in a whole bunch of debauchery. I'm going to stay up late. I'm going to drink. I'm going to party. And I'm going to accept that I'm going to die in my 40s or 50s. And I don't want to have a 70 to 80 year old life where I don't do those things and I just age more slowly. I'm going to go big and go hard. In the 21st century, the, the wisdom is the te technology is coming that could radically extend life. And we may, with the advancements in AI, we may be entering into an era of human existence that is more spectacular than any human has ever experienced. And I don't think we want to miss out on that. Now, of course, things can go wrong, sure. But I just think given the situation right now, the thing I hope people contemplate is the one thing you don't want to do is die. You don't want to miss out on what's coming. And uh, I mean, radical things are coming. And so do your very, very best right now to be in the game for as long as you can. And that's what I'm trying to do is slow my speed I of aging. I love it. I love I it. I'll, cool. Yeah. Is that I love it. Nope. I love it, man. I think you, you know, it's funny. I was telling people that the same thing, like a lot of people are getting this anxiety about AI and all sorts of things that are happening. And it feels like 
we are completely out of control. I was like, what if we could just write this? Like, imagine yes. the view. Imagine the view with that. And and just don't die. And and metaphorically, re- realistically, all of that it put together. It's so interesting. What are your top three or four predictions on health and human life that we'll see probably in this decade? Uh, first uh, is the acceptance that what I've demonstrated with Blueprint that an algorithm does a better job at taking care of my of me than I can myself will become obvious and will be seen as an inevitability. Mm-hmm. So humans always hold on to what has been and what is, and we will all go through the seven stages of grief of realizing that an algorithm is better at this game than we are. And so that will be, and what we'll have to do is we'll reconstruct our realities to say, you know what? <laughs> Amazing. I now I'm going to find new games for my mind to play because if somebody has something to look forward to, it's easy to pass something off. It's just people don't know what to do. So if they say, if I'm not making decisions on a daily basis about what I'm going to eat and I can't have this sensorial pleasure, um, I don't know what to do with my existence. And so once they can find something else to do with themselves, so it's just a natural reconciliation reconciliation process. I think we will basically say, just like we are going through this process of uh, autopilots fly airplanes, uh, they will fly, they will drive our cars, they they um you know uh, they do they they write things for us, they process ideas for us. Like these algorithms, they just do things better for us. So one is this inevitability of we will step into embracing algorithms running our health. So we can attach ourselves to compounded rates. So that's number one. Uh, number two is once we get our heads around this idea that death, decay, decline may not be inevitable, it's going to dramatically change how we think about the world and each other. So is you know is a changing climate something that we can passively observe? and just try to ignore, or do we need to take aggressive action to try to ensure sustainability? Is war a good idea? You know, is, is a death a good idea? Uh, are we okay to play this nuclear brinkmanship game and have the extinction of our species on a trigger? Like all these things that have been normalized over our time of like how we just are on the edge of annihilation or like severely crippling problems, we may view the world very differently and may become more compassionate as a species, less prone to war, less prone to violence, less at each other's throat, and just elevate ourselves to be a more compassionate species. And then I'd say number three is we may raise our aspirations on what we can become. Right now, you know, when we think about what technology can become, like we say, like we map it out into the, the most crazy terms, but with humans, we put a ceiling on ourselves. Like what can we become? And we just know what they are. There's no surprises. Somebody may break a, an Olympic world record on this thing or that thing by 10 milliseconds, but we don't think of humans as having this infinite uh, expansive horizon. And if we can show that we have this room to move into a horizon of new abilities, it doesn't have to be an IQ. It can be in a, a divergent sense of what we are. Uh, we may be energized as like a, a new frontier of exploration uh, in our conscious existence. So I think we, we really could be on the cusp of radical evolution as a species. It just takes a few baby steps to get ourselves, get our heads around these new ideas. And I think we might be really energized to walk into it. Imagine you were made the president of the country right now. And, and let's say prosperity has been solved. AI has taken care of a lot of the work that we need to do. And let's say we've managed to figure out all the issues. And let's say we've not figured out the health part of this. Uh, what are the few innovative ideas that you might implement for the country as a metric uh, uh, to do this? Like, for example, I thought about one thing. What if there was an Olympic for achieving the best on health metrics, right? And and you are a world record holder on some of the things. Uh, what are the other things that you would do as a president of the country? If you If you want to build a boat teach the crew how to yearn for the sea. <laughs> what, what do we yearn for as a species? What are we fighting for? Where are we going? 
you know, we plan for work advancement and making money and children and even our own death. What's our plan as a species? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you've managed to ever got get into details of a lot of the ancient Indian uh, spiritual stuff, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, has a lot of things that you talk about. Mm -hmm. right? And it's from hundreds of or hundreds or thousand years ago or thousands of years ago. And it seems that we are in this perpetual loop. Uh, I have a controversial uh, belief that uh, and, and, and I don't know if it's true, uh, is every time a society evolves, it has a low birth rate and then we end up into the same routine again. Because when you read a lot of these things, you're like, these guys had it all figured out. It seems that they were fully, clearly knowing what's going on. And we seem to be just kind of getting wiped out with that mm -hmm. lot. And then we reset ourselves to the new batch that seems to be reset. We don't pass any genetic wisdom genetically. So we tend to be kind of, as a species, kind of going in loops. So I don't know if you have really studied the Jainism, Buddhism, many of these uh, belief systems, and, and, and you will realize that it's quite interesting how similar they are to your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the interesting thing about this is each generation of human map aspirations equal to their technology. So in the time of Buddha, you know, a cutting edge technology would be to meditate and, you know, achieve the, the meditative states that he put out as the aspiration, you know, Nirvana as like um, with the mindfulness. And then if you look at like um, Islam and Christianity, it was like, Hey, these heavenly beings came to us visit us and bestowed wisdom upon us that we're now going to share with you about the way we should exist in society. And then you arrive at our time and, you know, because we've built computers and games, we say we're in a simulation. And so every generation maps their understanding of existential nature and aspirations according to the technological uh, abilities. And so if we, if we try to just like, to your point, if we say, we have to understand that our imaginations, our aspirations, our frameworks are a product of our own time. Like we're trapped in our own time. And we do our best to come up with our ideas of our own time, but we're trapped. And the people in you know, 50 years, 100 years, and 200 years are going to have entirely different frames on what they consider to be aspiration worthy. But we're, we're bounded by this. And this is why... One of my favorite ideas I, I like working with is I came up with this concept, uh, zero with principle thinking. I kept on bumping up against this of, I could fill my own limitations with my creativity and my own intelligence. I just kept on bumping up and feeling like, ah, I just, I just can't reach past this point and it's so frustrating. And one, one night I went to bed and I, I asked my, my mind, hey, could you help me come up with a framework, like a, a, a structured and methodical framework on how to think about the future, not in woo-woo terms, but in like some, some way I could actually do so in a, in a methodical way. And then I came up with this idea of zero principle thinking. And so the easiest way to say this is uh, talent hits the target that no one else can. That's first principles thinking, right? You're stripping away all the assumptions. You're trying to get to the, the bare bones. So talent hits a target uh, no one else can. Genius hits the target no one can see. And that's zero with principle thinking. And so there's two ways to innovate. You can be an innovator with first principles thinking, and you can innovate being a zero with principle thinker, which is basically you're looking at unknown unknowns and I'm not trying to map your way into that. And to me, uh, uh, we are in a situation uh, as a species where we need to, okay. Um, we are walking into a zeroth principle future. We cannot predict it. We cannot model it. We can't anticipate it. Uh, and there's going to be more zeroth principle discoveries 
uh, at a faster rate than ever has been. So for example, if you say what qualifies as a zero principal insight, well, space and time being relative, you know, uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity is a zero principal insight. It existed in the mm -hmm. universe. Mm -hmm. We just found it. And so if you say, you know, like, um, and then if you look at AlphaGo when they played Lisa Dahl, 19-time world champion, and observers of that game of Go said, like, watching AlphaGo play this game is like watching it from another dimension. It played moves of genius that humans could have played for thousands of years. They never did. And so it was just like this thing no one else could see. And so now AI is our partner now. And AI is introducing zeroth principle insight at a speed much faster than humans have been able to do over a couple thousand years, which means the fundamental architecture of our existence is changing at a pace that it never has in the past. And we're not, we're not changing at the speed of human thought anymore. We're changing at the speed of a computational thought. And so we are um, walking furiously into a zero principle future. So to me, what we aspire to is we say, we don't know where we're going or what we're doing, or we can't even model it out. And it's the most exciting thing that has ever happened to any human in history. And so let's embrace the zero principle nature of our situation. Let's remove our own self-destructive tendencies that would ruin the party if we died individually or if we kill each other collectively. Let's just not do destructive stuff. And let's walk into this future that may be more majestic than anything we've ever been able to imagine. I love it, Brian. I love it. Uh, what's your view on with AI coming in, uh, the speed of innovation, the speed of change? Uh, like I was looking at reflecting on we are a four and a half year old company and I've had one major crisis a year already, like from yeah. COVID to geopolitical situation to market meltdowns to AI coming in now. Uh, and it's going to get, probably become six months, two months, a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And humans can't really learn. Uh, we, we take like 25 years to make somebody a, 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 a little bit of a rational human to kind of put in workforce. Like that's the amount of yeah. training we need to do. How do you think we'll adjust to this rate of change? Yeah, I agree with you entirely. And so like, I just look at myself with Blueprint is I've attached my physical being with a system of improvement through science and technology. As soon as we find scientific evidence that something can be done in my diet or supplement or something else is instantaneously implemented in my routine and it's done. Uh, it does not have to pass through my brain to say, is this a good idea, a bad idea? Do I want this? Do I not want this? It just passes. And so that has substantially improved the speed of my own adoption of science and technology. And it's based upon evidence and data. So we have safety and efficacy protocols in place. Uh, but basically, my mind is not the rate limiter. And I mean, my mind is just the problem causer for so many things. And so I guess if we think about this at a broader societal scale, scale we need to rebuild society so we are adaptable. And so this, the, my, my favorite experience on this story is that, on this idea, is I was in the Middle East with a, a leader of a country, and he was planning out his 2030 goals. This was in 2016. And I said, boy, that's really challenging to contemplate planning for 2030, uh, 14 years from now, when the world is changing so dramatically. And he said, okay, what would you do? And so I thought, okay, let me think about this. Like, what, what's a thought experiment I could run that would maybe get at this? And I said, okay, let's imagine we have two robots and we're trying to get to the distant point on the sand over there. We can do one of two things. One is we can create a map and, and we, get, we do a topographical map of the sand. We program it in the ro robot and say, go. But, you know, we know that in a few minutes, the sands are going to shift. The robot's going to be stuck and then game over. The second way is to just um, give the robot the tools it needs to adapt as fast as possible, no matter how the sands shift, give the GPS coordinates and say go, and just rely upon that robot being able to adapt itself to whatever throws its way. And so to me, the answer is, uh, we need to uh, think about how we become adaptable as a species. Uh, that's our number one characteristic. It's not our intelligence, it's how fast we can adapt. What are you most scared of? Uh for the decade that is coming? 
I don't think I've, I don't think I process reality through fear. I, um, uh, it's not an emotion I, I really resonate with. Um, humans are remarkable. You know, like there's, it's so easy to, uh, isolate the acrimony between humans and this and that. But if you look at us, uh, the human race over a longer period of time, uh, we're unbelievably resilient. And there's also a lot of really interesting data on, you know, when one human shows something's possible, so many humans can step up and do the exact same thing. Uh, and so uh, I'm encouraged that if we make a few little baby steps where we say, Hey, the self-destructive behaviors are not a good thing. Let's rebuild ourselves around, you know, uh, constructive things where we want we want to evolve ourselves as a species. We want to get rid of this primitive thing of nuking each other and of you know killing each other. We want to go to more compassionate ways to resolve our differences. And like you know, we really want to exist. Like to me, it really boils down to lucky us we exist let's play an infinite game together. Like that's it. I mean, existence doesn't get any more complicated to me than that. I didn't ask to be here. I don't know why I'm here. I'm here. I really enjoy it here. I want to keep on being here. Let's not mess it up. And so I think, you know, we saw the world dramatically change in COVID. We, we saw the world do things that we thought were impossible that became possible in a week or a month or two months. We are capable of doing impossible things. And so I don't put it past us at all that we could dramatically change norms on planet earth, put ourselves in a situation where we can thrive. Like I'm really encouraged by our ability to do that. Now that does not mean we're not going to kick and scream and like <laughs> all the stuff we do because you know, the future drags us into its presence, whether we like it or not. But I, I think that uh, a few of these things like, you know, what blueprint has demonstrated are very strong uh, potential uh, milestone markers on how we contemplate our future as a species. I love it. I'm going to ask you last two questions, Ryan. Do you, I mean, I, I can I can do this all day long. I have so much uh, to learn from you. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting thing that you talked about, zero principle, like thinking about stuff that can't be thought about. What are the few places, books or videos or anything that people can do to get good at this or at least be mm -hmm. fully aware of this? Any Any recommendations that you have? Yeah, I, I personally, my, my arrival to this point is I love reading biographies. Love it. And yeah, it's, and specifically about people in their time and place where they were able to embrace first principle thinking and zeroth principle thinking and discover things that no one else could see. And typically, you know, the responses are expected. People didn't believe them. They thought they were crazy, stupid, like all the stuff that's normal. And they changed society. And so learning how to um, basically, I think, I think what we really need as a species is uh, we have Gen Z and you know, Gen X and whatever else. I think we need, uh, need a new Gen, Gen Zero that specializes in zeroth principle thinking and say and says like we basically are willing to divorce ourselves from all things human every custom every norm every everything we have we've we've built to this date it's great we appreciate you also we're willing to sever that and move forward in the zero principle landscape and open ourselves up to brand new forms of existence i think if we try to hold on to the past too tightly we may get ourselves in trouble because the speed, as you, as you commented, the speed of AI is not going to negotiate with human tolerance on speed of movement. We will need to get ourselves in a situation to become highly adaptable. And so if we, if we think about this of like, we actively and eagerly are leaning into zero principle thinking and searching out these insights. And so to me, really, it, it's been reading these biographies has helped me see patterns in people throughout history who have been able to move society forward on large scale endeavors. And uh, that's really what I care. That's the game I care to play. And so learning from these people in these books has been awesome. And that's the game I'm trying to play myself is how do I, in the early 21st century, try to contribute something with my fellow team members that is noteworthy in the 25th century.
any specific few two three people that blew your mind in their biographies blew the blew your mind anyone that you can recommend now i'll tell you just a few books that i've recently read so i wouldn't even say this is not a ranking this is only sure. based upon recency of reading Yep. is I really enjoyed reading about Claude Shannon's information theory. Interesting. You know, when, when, yeah, it's like, how did we figure out how to communicate on the internet and inter the transatlantic cable? And, you know, like, how did he do that was really exciting and fun. Um, the, the biography of zero. So how did zero come about? It had to work its way through philosophy and religion and math like the discovery we think zero is an obvious situation it's not it took humanity hundreds of years to figure out zero and mm -hmm. it wrecked societies and like it was really so i'd say the biography of zero uh is a great book fantastic uh, yep and then third um i just finished the magellan mm -hmm. uh circumnavigation of the globe yep so like it was there was just like this fever pitch excitement about this idea that you could sell into this uh, frontier that no one knew. And so you have these wild imaginations, but it's, it's the same characteristics. Like you have a new frontier, there's a gold rush mentality. Humans are hot on the trail of, you know, like trying to get rich and status and power. And then you have this whole exploration in front of it. So uh, yeah, those three are um, recency right. in my mind of good patterns. Thank you. Thank you for those recommendations. One final question, uh, Brian, I'm going to let you go. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, uh, for a lot of people who are going to be listening to this and going to be inspired that they need to enjoy the next few decades that's coming our way, that's going to be the best time ever, and they have been in self-destructive behavior, mm -hmm. what would you tell them to do to get started? Like, What are the two or three things that yeah. seem hard but that you recommend that they should start going. Yeah. A really powerful baby step you can take is identifying yourself a self-destructive behavior that you do. And so it could be, for me, it was, it was eating too much food of the wrong kind of food at 7 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have your own version. I called this guy eating Brian. So identify your self-destructive behavior um, and then look at it with specifics. So with me, it was 7 p.m., uh, it was when I was worn down from the day, stress was very heavy. I was ruminating all the problems I had in life. And then this version of me would show up and he would say, you've worked so hard today. Uh, you really did a wonderful job. You deserve a treat. You know, like the brownies are just a few steps away. We'll just do one tomorrow. We're going to get started. So I was able to identify what persuasion tech, uh, uh, tactics Evening Brian used on me on a daily basis to try to get me to behave badly. And then three, I wrote these things down. So I said, okay, Evening Brian is my nemesis. He uses the following tactics to try to persuade me. And now I'm going to systematically tell him no. And so when he showed up, I would say, hi, Evening Brian, welcome. Uh, I know you're here. I know what you're going to say. And no, I'm not going to say yes. And then I would, in my mind, watch Evening Brian just throw a tantrum, you know, on the floor, banging the floor, punching a hole in the wall, like, you know, getting so upset. And I would just sit there and watch him and say, you know what? I know it's uncomfortable. I know it hurts, but guess what? This is not going to happen anymore. But the the actual process of going through of naming him, identifying his, his persuasion tactics, and then saying no and watching him uh, flounder was so empowering. And I just had to do that a few times to then get control to say, I'm not a puppet driven by a puppet master. I I don't have to do everything in my mind and my uh, you know, what do these versions say? I have control. And so I'd say the advice I'd give is find the worst versions of yourself that are responsible for your worst self destructive behaviors, give them a name, identify their tactics, and stop them in their tracks. Just one version of yourself and get the wrestle the power that you have control of yourself in one little area of your life. I love it, Brian. This has been so much fun. I, I really look forward to meeting you in person. I couldn't wait to do this what you did on Zoom. I'm gonna come see you sometime. Uh, we need to spread your religion uh, uh, and and uh, make this a thing. Uh, and I hope you are super successful in all the things that you want to do. Uh, and may you get even more ambitious. Thank yeah. you. You're so you're so kind. Thank you very much. I appreciate talking to you today. Bye bye. bye.